Good day, everyone. Welcome to Gaia STEM lecture series of Taiwan Top Science Student Project. I'm today's host, Juling Shi from National Central University, Taiwan. It's my best honor to introduce our speaker today, Professor Grace Chen. She's an assistant professor in the Department of Plastics Engineering at the University of Massachusetts Law, where she directs the Plastics and Environment Research Laboratory. Grace re received her bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from National Taiwan University, master's degree and PhD in agricultural and biological engineering from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and a postdoctoral training in chemical engineering from Purdue University. Her lab is equipped with reactors for hydrothermal processing of plastic waste and bio-waste as well as characterization for fuel, polymers, thin fumes, microplastics. In addition, her lab also has a license to a specialized software, Hansen solubility parameter in practice, to study polymer dissolution precipitation behavior, coating removal, polymer diffusion, and packaging failure mechanisms. The Chance Group Research Program contributes to the development of new multidisciplinary materials on the topic of plastic waste recycling, bio-based plastic material and sustainability analysis. Professor Chen is affiliated with many academic associations such as American Chemical Society and Society of Plastic Engineers, just to name a few. To date, she has also, she has not only published many research articles, but also has won US patent and has won many awards. Today, we invite Professor Chen to continue our topic last month about waste management and to talk about up upcycling plastic waste for a circular economy. Without further ado, let's welcome Professor Chen to talk about how to turn trash into treasure. Professor Chen, Grace. Oh, th thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I hope everyone can see my screen and can hear me well. Yes. Um, thank you. So thank, uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, uh, Professor Shu's uh, kind in uh, invitation. It's my great honor to talk to everyone. Uh, I believe it's Saturday morning in Taiwan now. I. Um, used to be one of you, I remember that uh, I, so I attended the Taipei First um, Girls High School. And at, during the high school, we used to attend a lot of seminar like this, interacting with um, uh, professors or faculties, uh, either nationally or internationally. So um, anyhow, I'm passionate to give this talk and interact with, uh, with you today. And feel free to ask the questions um, at the end. Uh, I'll be more than happy to entertain some, some questions. And uh, just bear with me to uh, present this in English as most of the content is prepared in, in English. Um, so let's, let's uh, check it out what I have today then, wrong button. So um, today I would like to, my goal um, by the end of today's talk, and hopefully I can get it done in about 40 uh, to 45 minutes is to give everyone, the audience here, a taste about how polymer science and plastics engineering could address the sustainability issue. Especially like, I'm pretty sure you hear the term like circular economy, plastic waste uh, very much in the past couple of years, especially during COVID. Uh, I mean, during the pandemic of COVID-19, we use a lot of one-time use plastics like masks, um, so on and so forth, a lot of different biomedical devices. So that's my goal today. And I'll show you some case studies and some examples about how we make it work. Um, and I would like to just give you a little bit taste about how this uh, correlated to chemistry or even physical sciences. To start with, I have to acknowledge my uh, the sponsor for this, the for me to develop this presentation. Uh, the majority of the work you see today is based on the uh, project uh, funded by the US Department of Energy 
and a consortium of the Remade uh, Institute, as well as several industry members that uh, I'll show them uh, at the end. So here's my outline today. Uh, first of all, I would like to introduce myself uh, a little bit formally. I would like to talk just very briefly talk about my group. And then I would like to tell you uh, why this is an important topic to work on and to address and uh, to resolve this issue. Uh, we, my group, we study three different kinds of recycling uh, in terms of their um, uh, maturity, in terms of the technique, as well as the uh, difficulty um, in terms of the technology development. So let me lay out like the traditional way, mechanical recycling, uh, selective solvent extraction, where we could sort of uh, wash or extract, purify uh, relatively salty plastic waste. And, and at the end, if these are very dirty plastics, we have to break everything down. Um, and I specifically, my group study uh, hydrothermal uh, liquefaction processes. So just want to talk a little bit about what uh, we are doing in general as a polymer plastics engineer. We study the materials, namely the polymer materials. We also design the parts. Um, you, you will see me show a lot of properties like um, polymer properties in terms of the molecular way. Uh, I hope everyone has breakfast here, but if not, uh, later after the talk, if you are going to enjoy the breakfast, you having some noodles, you can imagine polymer is like a very, very long noodles. So we have to quantify like how long this noodle it is, things like that. And then we have to have study machine to make these plastics uh, per se. So we are a niche department. The department is relatively uh, uh, small, but we do we do house a large quantity of graduate school uh, students. Actually, I'll skip that very quickly. Um, so I want to use this slide to remind everyone the importance of this uh, topic. According to uh, a review article, and several actually uh, not just this article published from our own group, but several articles published in the last few years, we found that uh, if we um, the we have as a society, human one, we have uh, accumulated uh, about 8 billion, 8 billion tons of plastics um, that have been generated so far, okay? And if we don't stop this trend and continue this trend by 2050, we will have, um, we, we will have about 28 billion metric tons of plastics. Think about it, that's a very um, huge number. In fact, some study even says that if we don't stop the trend at the end, uh, by the end of 2050, we'll find more uh, plastics than fish in the ocean, which would be a bad news for um, a country like Taiwan, where we are surrounded by uh, a lot of oceans and we, we don't want that, right? We don't want like while we are enjoying the seafood, we have to worry about our health. Uh, so let's take a look, uh, how about the recycling rate? If we want to stop this trend and we must uh, figure out a way to address that. Traditionally, we incinerate that, but incineration not necessarily is the best way. Um, how about we recycle that? But uh, you can see the recycling rate is relatively low. In fact, uh, less than 10% in the US. Um, I, I believe this number is slightly better than uh, in, in East Asia. But uh, in the US, this number is very, very low then. And among the plastics we generated, um, you can see that the majority of them are in this family, uh, namely polyethylene and polypropylene. Um, so we call them polyolefins in, in general. In terms of their chemical structures, um, they are very, very robust per se, very, very stable. And that's why it's very difficult to break them down or just to recover them. So let's also take a, a look on the demand then. The demand actually uh, concerning me more is this um, single use packaging. We use it typically every day and then followed by the textiles and consumer products. So to address this issue, um, as I mentioned, there are several ways. Um, my lab, we specifically study the thermochemical recycling. Uh, namely, we use thermal, the heat, 
and chemical, we use, uh, we add the chemical to initiate some reactions such as chemolysis, uh, including glycolysis, hydrolysis. Uh, we also study uh, hydropyrolysis, which is the hydrothermal liquefaction. And I want to uh, explain a little bit uh, from the plastic waste management point of view in terms of the hierarchy, um, typically we, we landfill that and then we incinerate that um, or we convert them into fuel or chemical. Um, and then we can recover that as a material as well. Uh, so most valuably, if we can recover plastic back as plastic, they will be the best. To make this work, we need to re we need to visit some polymer science that I'm going to talk about later. So first, I will in the next couple of slides I'll show you why uh, how we make mechanical recycling work, and I'll talk about um, its its constraint and challenge. Uh, but first, I'll introduce the science behind that, um, and then you, hopefully you'll realize why making it work is difficult. We we'll also talk about how to use uh, solvent dissolution precipitation to um, extract, to purify, uh, and finally reclaim the polymer structure back. So for this kind of recycling, we call it material recycling. And finally, uh, we will talk about how we use heat or chemical to break down, sorry, to break down the polymer. And again, we want to avoid to just burn the plastic or to landfill that. Um, so this is the hierarchy when we talk about the plastic waste management. Um, so I also want to uh, showcase uh, my, my labs. I have to uh, appreciate the majority of the students' uh, hard work here. You will see a lot of slides making by this group here. But we do have another group study the biodegradable and microplastics pollutants present in the environment. Um, so today you'll see the majority uh, of the work from this side of the group. Then. So I'll skip this. If we have time, we can go back to talk about the other work we did in my group. So the first case study I want to show is based on a work, uh, based on a PhD student's work. This is based on Sean Marty's work. So first, we want to know if we can just um, use the conventional, relatively conventional, relatively mature way called mechanical recycling to uh, recycle the common plastics. But different from what has been done in the state of the art, we would like to improve uh, the mechanical property of this mixed plastics by adding some uh, elast elast elastic elastic material like rubber or uh, nano clay to make it more stronger. So in in this case, we have acquired some uh, plastics that has been uh, collected from the ocean shore, or we call them the ocean bound plastics, and then they have been sort of pretreated. And then we have studied how to mix them, mixing and compounding them using the polymer processing. And eventually we hope that uh, this can be, um, the product obtained from at the end of the project can be used to enable 3D printing again. So now I would like to just give you a very um, brief introduction about this polymer theory. So uh, delta G here, it represents a Gibbs free energy upon mixing two polymers. And I was earlier when I was preparing this slide, I was thinking how to make a metaphor here. So basically you can think that um, this Gibbs free energy is the, is the indicator. If it's negative than zero, like if it's uh, negative, which means it's smaller than zero, then this reaction would automatically happen. It's called spontaneous reactions. Um, and then the Gibbs free energy is dictated by the enthalpy upon mixing two polymer minus the entropy multiplied by the heat, multiplied by the processing temperature. 
And typically the enthalpy of mixing for polymer is, uh, is, is really, this can be fine tuned and further adjusted by adding some polymer additives to, inter, to improve the interfacial interactions, which I'll, I'll talk a, a little bit very uh, in a moment. And then the entropy here between two polymer, typically that is very, very small. And I'm not sure if, uh, if the audience here has played this video game before, but when I was a kid it, back in Taiwan, I uh, had this Nokia phone, okay? And then in the Nokia cell phone, there's a game called uh, the snakes, where the snakes will grow longer and longer and longer, and eventually it will run into the wall and then the, it will be game over. So basically the polymer here is like this. Imagine you have two snakes in that video game and they are trying to um, they are trying to find a way in try to mix it with each other or trying to sort of create some random pathway. It'll be very difficult, especially when these two snakes they are become longer and longer and longer. It'll be easier if they are just a dot and we can make it like uh, distribute very randomly. So in a way, I, I hope I convince you that's why mixing two polymer is very difficult. Basically, we are mixing two very long chain of uh, molecule. They are they behave very differently uh, than, than small molecules then. Even for polyethylene, high density polyethylene and low density polyethylene, they don't mix well, even though they are the same family of polymer, okay? So uh, typically we need to add some one thing called compatibilizer. They will make these two polymer work and then improve their interfacial uh, intent in their interfacial uh, interaction here then. So this is what we are trying to do in, in this project based on the polymer th blend theory. We try to compatibilizing the blend, the two blends. And here we are just showing you the binary blends. Uh, in the project, we actually achieve uh, ternary or crotary, um, so on, so forth, and more. So we consider two, two types of compatibilizer here. One is the polybutadiene. It's, it's also part of the polyolefin family, but they are rubber. And we also uh, adopt this uh, clay and trying to use the polymer processing to exfoliate it, making sure um, it can but it can be well mixed in this polymer blend. So after that, hopefully we can improve that. And you can see that uh, these two phase now, they are being mixed better compared to before. There will be a very um, distinguished uh, boundary layer. So I'll skip the detail. We have published this work uh, just last year, but basically we want to try to see if we can mix the this this uh, at least three of these commodity polymers. These are five, probably five of the most commonly used polymers in our daily world. PET is like your PET bottle. Uh, HDP is like the milk jars or the detergent jar. This is our single use bags. Um, the bag you may see in a grocery supermarket. Um, these are used in a lot of food containers. Uh, polystyrene is also used for bandong or something like that. A lot of the food containers, the clamshell uh, uh, food box typically is made of polystyrene. And then we study different kinds of compatibilizer. They're trying to improve the compatibilization between uh, several different polymers. So we use a benchtop machine here called a uh, micro compounder. And our source uh, is based on the ocean plastic waste. Ultimately, we would like to able to address uh, this um, horribly degraded polymers, like all these fishing gears we find in the ocean. And we use uh, different tools to study how well they mix by observing them under uh, electronic microscope, by measuring and understanding their melting enthalpy uh, and evaluating their um, mechanical property, uh, viscosity, things like that. So this is a very quick uh, summary here. Eventually we, we, we have a, 
we have a gigantic design of experiment, but this is the summary where we down select uh, the three groups here, where based on what we see, actually I can show the picture here. This is how they look like. Some of them are very brittle. Some of them are very um, are much more elastic. Typically we want to have very flexible um, after the blending. Okay, so this would indicate they, they are well mixed. So based on this, we further observe them under uh, scanning uh, electronic microscope. So you can see that without any compatibilizer, we see a lot of uh, holes here. This indicate it didn't mix very, very well. Um, and then with EPR here, again, it was not at, uh, from, from here, you, you still see a lot of structure, uh, like whole structure. Again, it's, it's because they are not at, uh, mixed well yet. Um, we have to further fine tuning the, the condition later, the processing condition later. If we want to achieve a very, very com uh, well compatibilization. And most importantly, we have to evaluate the uh, mechanical properties. As I mentioned, if they are mixed well, uh, typically at the end of, uh, of uh, at the end of the, uh, once we create uh, a STM uh, tensile bar, we'll be able to understand their uh, tensile strength and elongation in this case then. So again, I will, um, I want to, uh, uh, if, if I want to like jump to the next uh, project, but uh, we have published all the related results in, in this journal. Um, where we document all, all the findings we, by mixing different types of commodity polymers. Uh, so I want to, this is uh, the first case study I would like to uh, benchmark on, and hopefully that convince you mixing two polymers together um, is not an easy job. And then we have to rely on the uh, fundamental science behind the polymer blend theory to resolve that. And in fact, in that project, we further study other uh, nanoclade um, in a, in a follow-on project. But in the in the interest of time, uh, I will pause here for that project. Now, I would like to skip a sweet. Uh, I would like to uh, switch the gear, and I would like to showcase some chemical or uh, advanced recycling technologies. Um, similarly, on the same direction of polymer mixing thermodynamics, I would like to talk about this solvent extraction technologies or solvent extraction science. Uh, I, I, hopefully today we also have time to cover this hydrothermal processing. Um, and I would like to use the reaction temperature and reaction pressure to talk a little bit about why we study the solvent dissolution in hydrothermal processing instead of like uh, traditional pyrolysis or gasification, because we want to make sure at the end of the day, by recycling polymer or recycling plastic waste, we can do it in a sustainable and energy efficient uh, efficient way. And, and, and that's why we uh, prefer to use the method that operate at lower temperature because they will dictate our energy efficiency very much down the road. But here we sacrifice the pressure load. The reaction of these three technology, they could happen at a relatively high pressure uh, environment and how to study the balance between temperature and pressure and how they affect the um, solvent dissolution and, and the supercritical fluid uh, mixing science is what my group study mainly. So with that in mind, hopefully I justify and convince you why studying the dissolution technology makes sense in terms of the energy efficiency. So here I would like to use a moment to talk about what's going on in this uh, equation here. So I don't want to like uh, bore you on, on Saturday morning, but I want to uh, show you this equation here. Uh, the best way I used to explain this using the layman language is you can imagine this uh, tool, Hansen Solubility Parameter here. It is a GPS. I'm pretty sure everyone uses GPS or Google Map or Apple Map uh, these days. 
So this is a, a, a Google map, map basically for polymer, for dissolving polymer in a solvent. So you can consider this um, globe here, this sphere here, it's, it represents the solubility probability of a polymer because polymer, it doesn't have the exact molecular, uh, exact molecular weight. So unlike a small molecule like a salt or sugar, we know their solubility in certain solvent. Uh, polymer doesn't have that. In fact, there's um, um, there's a certain um, there's an uncertainty here, and therefore we use a sphere to represent the probability to dissolve it. And therefore, you can imagine this this sphere. It can grow, it can expand, but it can also shrink depending on the solubility nature of this polymer. Now, the dot here, you can imagine that's the target you input in your Google map, where this dot here, uh, we input it in this polymer, in this Hansen solubility parameters world, the coordinate we, enter, we input instead of the string number uh, in a Google map in order the city name, we input three parameters. They are named the dispersion parameter, polarity, polarity of a solvent, or hydrogen bonding force of a solvent. Okay, and we want to find and identify a solvent. Eventually, that's within this sphere, which represents a solubility probability of polymer. Instead of something be outside of the sphere, if it's outside of the sphere we know that most likely it's not a good solvent to dissolve this polymer. If it's within the sphere, then uh, most likely like 90% more or more, uh, this solvent could, could dissolve uh, this, this polymer then, okay? So this is not something new actually, this is based on uh, Dr. Charles Hansen's uh, PhD thesis back in 1970, 1980. And then uh, Professor Charles Hansen, he is stepped on the shoulder of Professor, um, of Dr. Hindenbrand's work, uh, which is also based on the polymer solubility. And what's new recently is people actually using the molecular uh, dynamics tool called Cosmos Therm to better improve this. But again, it's beyond the topic of today. So with that in mind, I would like to uh, explain why we need to learn this polymer mixing uh, thermodynamics then. With this, for example, if the waste we would like to recover, we know it's, it's, it's solubility, okay? We'll be able to formulate and identify a solvent that could help us extract this specific polymer. And this is especially important for relatively mixed uh, plastic waste such as the uh, electronic waste uh, that I show here. So this is uh, electronic waste uh, residue where uh, a, a e-waste recycling company, they already took, they already taken those valuable parts. So first we study uh, what's inside of this electronics and then we found plastic uh, account for about uh, a quarter, like 25%. And among these plastics, the majority of them actually is made of polystyrene. Um, with this polystyrene in mind, we uh, again uh, take advantage of the Hansen solubility parameters that I just showed you, the, the Google map in the polymer science world. And then we 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 in the beta in the database, we found that there are at least two kinds of polystyrene we can find. And based on that, we'll be able to identify some solvent that will work in terms of dissolving and extracting this polymer, uh, this specific polymer, PS or uh, polystyrene in this case. We can also identify the so-called anti-solvent or non-solvent, which is far, far away from the center of this um, polymer. This means that once we add a drop, uh, in a solution, we'll be able to bring this polymer back. And we call this technology dissolution precipitation. And I'm going to show you how we use this in a real world application. But uh, let's, let's 
let's see another example we demonstrate here without seeing that animation. Uh, the similar technique can also be used to uh, purify the polycarbonate, which is a very valuable engineering plastic present in electronic waste. We use this method to select the anti-solvent and you can see water actually works very well in, uh, as a safer anti-solvent here to recover polycarbonate back. Biomethanol uh, will work better if we are using a dichromethane, which is a kind of organic, very toxic organic solvent, in fact, very hazardous one. So we use this dissolution precipitation processes. Uh, the way we use it is first we identify a solvent. It could be DCM, it could be uh, it could be dichromethane or another kind of solvent. First we dissolve the targeted polymer such as polystyrene or uh, polycarbonate, and then we can remove the undissolved one. Uh, in that case, some we we have polymer that undissolved and containing a hazardous. Uh, additive called flame retardants. And then we add another anti-solvent and try to uh, recover the polymer that's dissolved in the solution. Um, so in this case, it's methanol, methanol or ethylene glycol or EG in this case. And after that, we filter again, recover the, the polystyrene family back. And then we'll be able to recycle. Uh, ideally, we would like to recycle the solvent again so we can recover them for another round of use. And through here, most importantly, we actually want to remove these hazardous flame retardants. So the polystyrene and or the acronitrile butadiene styrene ABS, they can be purified and reused in cross industry. So I would like to show you here, um, we use this, uh, we measure the phosphorus content in our feedstock, which is the electronic charade residue. And we compare the efficient, the phosphorus removal efficiency when we switch and changing the anti-solvent. So phosphorus content here, it represents, it's, it's a key critical element present in this hazardous uh, flame retardants. We also use the same characterization protocol to quantify the removal efficiency of brominated uh, flame retardant. For the brominated one, uh, the, the, if it, the removal efficiency still needs some improvement though. But here you can see we were able to remove um, like more than 90% of phosphorus based flame retardant in this case. And their structure has been characterized uh, by using the pyrolysis uh, gas chromatography mass spectrometer, uh, where which we have documented in this journal. And what you see in the right hand side here is the molecular weight distribution of polymer. For a polymer, the most important thing is you again you can imagine a polymer like a very very long uh, noodle. At the end of the day, once we clean and extract this uh, polymer, we want the length of the noodle be very, very similar. We don't want it to be chopped down. If they are being chopped down, uh, they are not a variable anymore. In fact, we, we reduce their value. So we want to get the long noodle back as, as it is in terms of their length. And in terms, uh, we, we also want to purify, remove uh, those unwanted stuff. So what we show here is by using this dissolution precipitation technology, we were able to preserve their molecular distribution, which is a good thing actually. Um, and we found that the uh, feedstock based polystyrene and the uh, um, precipitated polystyrene, they share very similar molecular structure. Uh, similar trend was also fine here. Again, uh, uh, I would encourage you to, to uh, take a look of this journal article if interested. So I know now it's 940 and I would like to just very briefly talk about this hydrothermal liquefaction where we used subcritical and supercritical water to uh, depolymerize polymer. This is a very interesting topic to, to me. Actually, we, we spent a lot, I spent a lot of time on, on this topic. But again, I want to tell you a little bit why we want to use this method. And that's because traditionally we use heat 
like pyrolysis or gasification, just to burn down a polymer and break them down into oil. However, uh, as you can, as you observe the oil price, um, it fluctuate and it could be very volatile sometimes. And that's one reason. Another reason is it actually did not recover um, the, the most value of this uh, plastic waste back. Um, in fact, we want to be able to recover some valuable chemical from plastic waste so that we can close the loop, generate the chemicals they can use to, to synthesize new uh, polymer again. So there's a trend in the past two years or so where people are um, studying thermochemical conversion, um, but instead of producing oil or fuel down the road, we would like to produce valuable chemicals. And a lot of companies, they are very active in this area. Um, in fact, um, just uh, earlier this month, I realized the uh, LG Chemical from South Korea, they are, in, they, are in, in, they are licensing a technology to build a supercritical water plant um, in South Korea and trying to uh, implement a similar technologies. So with that in mind, I would like to tell you a little bit about what is supercritical and subcritical water. So personally, I teach thermodynamics uh, in, in, in my department, and we learn this in thermodynamics mostly. Uh, uh, this is a sophomore class in our uh, curriculum. So you can see this uh, water phase diagram in terms of the pressure and the temperature. So basically, uh, beyond the supercritical point of water here, we call it supercritical water. And at this supercritical state, water can enjoy the uh, transport properties, uh, the, the advantage of gas, but also the advantage of liquid. The diffusivity will be nice, uh, while the viscosity will be reduced. So it enjoy a lot of benefits. And that's why we study that. Another terminology is called subcritical water, where it's not gas anymore. By applying a little bit pressure, we maintain water as liquid, even we increase the pressure. Okay, so I, I like to use a metaphor again. Uh, I, I enjoy cooking. So again, I'll use some metaphor you will see in, in kitchen. So I, I'm pretty sure a lot of you used a pressure cooker. So actually this is how pressure cooker works where we apply pressure and they would help your parents uh, when they cook, uh, for example, congee or some beef soup, instead of taking forever, it takes about an hour or so and, and boom, that's your delicious meal. That's how the pressure cooker actually work. But here we are not cooking food. Instead, we are trying to turn in uh, very, very horrible trash or very, very horrible plastic waste. Like all what you see here, this is the so-called microplastic particle. So three, four, five, six, nine, ten, and seven here, they are the microplastic particles. One, two, eight here, they are not a microplastic particle level yet, but they will if they sit in the environment long enough. So these are uh, some real ways to, uh, I obtain from uh, in, through collaboration uh, with University of Hawaii, where they collect this from the shore. And you, uh, uh, so my point is that for plastic waste like this, there's no way we can use solvent or um, mechanical recycling to, to, to implement and try to recycle them. There's no value in, in this case because they are very badly degraded and very dirty. And therefore, uh, technology like hydrothermal liquefaction would be an attractive technology. So we have used this to, uh, to address a lot of different waste. Recently, we are most interested in the uh, uh, working um, with the multi-layer films, which has been commonly used in the food packaging, for example. So I'll, uh, I think I'll skip this as I know I'm running out of time in this case, and I want to uh, give you a chance for Q&A. So this is how the oil look like at the end. Um, so basically we study different reaction conditions under this supercritical water technology. And based on the polymer, actually I need to backwards, sorry. Based on the polymer we input, 
the temperature and and the temperature used and the reaction time needed would be slightly different. So, for example, this is a very uh, efficient technology, energy efficient technology to handle commodity plastics like polyethylene and polypropylene. And it also has been used to study like uh, other uh, commodity plastic like PET and PS. So typically you want to optimize the oil yield, identify the condition that can, that can achieve the highest oil yield. And then uh, we also have to uh, analyze it in this case, we found that by fine tuning the reaction condition, we'll be able to um, generate this so-called BTEX. It stands for benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, and xylene. They are uh, valuable aromatics. Uh, they are this BTEX single or uh, mono, mono ring uh, aromatics. They are valuable. However, if we have multi-aromatics uh, or polyaromatics, then that, that's, that's not good. Then. It means they become uh, char and PHS actually is uh, hazardous chemicals. So we want to uh, follow up studies. We want to know how we can generate more BTEX instead of, um, instead of this PHS in, in this case. Then. And we also want to know exactly what's going on uh, in terms of the role of water. So earlier I told you that supercritical water, it can serve as a reaction media where um, we enjoy the superior uh, transport and, and heat transfer properties. Um, but recently we also find out that water at a supercritical state, it actually may participate in the reactions. So that's something we are ongoing, uh, something we are still studying, uh, hopefully with more support from the federal government here in the US. However, I want to show you um, that uh, we also monitor the molecular way of this polymer at different reaction time. And you can see that uh, within 30 minutes, this method, oh, sorry, this technology, it has significantly reduced the molecular weight from around 33,000 delta to 5,000. But this 5,000 delta uh, polymer, it's actually still like solid. It, it's not totally broken down yet. So it takes another 30 minutes to further breaking it down into something waxy, uh, and if we wait longer, you become Oreo then. Uh, I figure some of the audience here may, may have strong uh, chemistry background and may have st or strong interest in chemistry. So I want to show some general mechanism here, but this is not done. <laughs> this is just some potential reaction mechanism for uh, when we use hydrothermal liquefaction to depolarize PE. So you can see that uh, for PE to start with, you can imagine it's a very, very long noodles and we gradually chop it down. But then at, as, at a point, uh, we may generate this methyl free radicals uh, or we may have this RCH2 ra free radicals or the free radicals can, can uh, be distributed in the middle. Um, and then after the reaction, potential reactions with water, uh, at the end, we have these paraffins and olefins. And then olefins, it will keep on going, being cyclized. Um, so we form the cyclics. And if we, if we, keep, if we keep heating, then cyclics, it will, re, we all, it will experience the dehydrogena dehydrogenation and remove hydrogen atom in this case, become aromatics. What I did not tell you in this figure is uh, we didn't put the, the, the free radicals that could be potentially contributed by water, or we did not add another polymer here, such as polypropylene here, and tell you what may happen. Will there be any interaction? Will there be any synergy? What would happen? How would they affect the distribution of this free radical? So still there are a lot of unknown that needs um, more study to, to breach the, uh, the knowledge gap in this area. So we have published this preliminary work in, as a paper last year in the Journal of Energy Institute. And last year, we also have this uh, thermochemical conversion 
of plastic waste into fuels review article. This was led by uh, Dr. Ren Shenyang, now a professor in National Taipei University of Technology, actually, um, coordinating with another PhD student in my group. So I would like to pause here and uh, the summary uh, I want to give you some take home message. If nothing at all, I want you to, to remember that to, uh, first of all, uh, plastic waste is a very um, complicated issue. And there's no silver bullet point here where um, there's no silver bullet. Basically we have to study multiple different technology to handle different kinds of plastic waste. And to make it work, we need people well-trained in a polymer science and polymer engineering or polymer engineering science area so that we can better address and tackle this challenging uh, topic. And even though the, you, may, you may argue some new technology is very expensive and unmature, like the supercritical water one, which I totally agree, but we have to get them ready today. So down the road in 20 years, 30 years, they can be more affordable. If we don't even get it started today, forget about it. It won't, it would never happen. So that's that's a need. We need to study this fundamental science behind, behind depolymerization. And the rest of them just for uh, how we can help this as, just as a citizen per se. Um, so I would like to pause here and see if there's any questions. Um, if not, here are my content method, and you are welcome to follow me on LinkedIn or uh, check our web lab laboratory's website. Um, and finally, I also need to acknowledge all the funding agencies who support my group in the past uh, few years or so. But I would like to pause here and uh, entertain with some questions. Um, thank you again for the invitation. Thank you, Professor Chen, for introducing to us the important work that you do to the earth. Uh, Grace has led us to look carefully into the chart. 25 tons of plastics by 2050 is a threatening number that I heard from the talk. And Grace works hard to find an energy efficient way to deal with plastic waste, upcycle instead of recycle for sustainability. Now I'd like to open up the floor for questions and discussions. Our audience can use the raise hand function to talk to our speaker today or write down your questions in the chat box and we will relay your questions to Professor Chen. Uh, if I can start using Chinese now, <laughs> that would maybe ease up uh, conversations between our young, young uh, audience with Grace. Um, 我今天发现呢，我们上个月的演讲者唐运婷老师也在线上。那我不知道是不适合去邀请唐老师。呃，如果您可以的话，也就上来跟我们一起做对话。那呃，上个月唐运婷老师也跟我们谈到了这个废
这样的这样的新的方法，就是也不是说新的方法，可能老师他也研究到一个程度，让让塑胶可以就是。透透过溶解的方式，不用火，用火火那个 t h e r m i c a l 呃那个 thermal chemical 的方式去去燃烧。那对于医疗废弃物这一块，会不会也有比较好的效应？因为我们知道在医院里面当中，它其实有点滴的软袋跟打针的那种硬的，那会不会有有有其就是这个方法用在医院上面，是不是也同样是？是可以解决这个大量的塑胶废弃物，就目前这两个问题。谢谢老师。嗯，先要现在回答吗？是一个一个回答。好、啊，好。所以第一个问题是说，呃，对于生物，呃，生物可降解分，呃，可降解的塑胶的提问，啊、呃，其实我们有研究，不过有研究那方面的啊、呃、题目，然后也有呃，最近几年也有发表。但是因为时间上面的限制，所以我没有呃，我没有就是分享那部分的研究。但我可以稍微讲一下，比如说，呃，像台湾的呃比较常见的是 PLA，、呃、我不知道中文就是了。但是 p o l y l a c t i c acid 啊、嗯呃、是最常见的。不过，但是啊、呃，生物可分解塑胶还是有几个问题。第一呢，成本上它一定是贵很多的。第二呢，它不一定降解的比较快哦。啊、呃，事实上，啊、呃，台湾的环保署还是环保局，它其实已经禁止使用 PLA 来当啊、呃，来来当那个一次性的餐具了。因为呢 ，PLA 它本身分降解其实要超过两年的，虽然它号称可分解、可生物降解。啊、嗯，然后它的原料一般是从玉米，如果是在美国做的话，但比如说是在巴西，他们可能就是从甘蔗里面去提炼那些呃酒精。呃、a n y、anyway, w a y 呃，这个 PLA 的生物可降解的周期也是非常非常的长。那一般它会需要在那些呃 industrial compost environment， 意思就是说在要一个要在一个工业的。啊、呃，环境控制的环境一般是在八十度 C 左右，它才有可能在两年内降解。如果你只是把你把它放在你家的后院啊，或是厨余桶，它是不可能降解的。那为了要解解决这个问题的话，像有的人现在开始他们是在研究，比如说 PHA 啊，啊、呃，这是这是最近比较红的一个一个 biodegradable polymer。或者是啊、呃，我想看还有什么，还还有很多啦。不过最重要的问题都是啊、呃，它生产的过程会比较昂贵，然后也不一定它可以降解的很好。然后最主要问题是它无法完全取代啊、呃，它无法呃呈现可以呃跟现在的 poly 跟现在的呃这些。呃、uh, ，commodity polymer 有 comparable 的 performance， 它的表现还是略略逊一等。这是为什么我们没有办法完全使用呃可可呃生物可降解的塑胶。然后第二个问题是医药废弃物的问题。对，其实一般医院他们是用啊、呃、焚烧的方式 ，incineration 焚烧的方式。所以很多医院他们自己在美国这边他们是有自己的 incinerator 的。那、啊、那最近我们开始有一个 project， 就是要研究说怎么使用。刚刚我讲的呃，水热解的方式来降解啊、呃，在生医产业里面，呃，生药产业里面使用的呃 ，packaging films， 因为就像呃您所讲，好像是 Hannah 吧，就像 Hannah 所讲的，呃，在医医疗产业，一般这些一一一次性的塑胶，为了要防止交叉感染，还有其他有可能的 biohazards 的问题。啊、呃，一般呢，它都是会使用热降解的方式。那传统上它就是焚烧这样子。刚有回答到你的问题吗？那老师，你会觉得说，会不会回到用玻璃比较好？<笑>呃，不会，因为呢，<笑>因为生产玻璃是非常非常非常的耗能的。实际上，<笑>呃，如果你去比较这个生产的过程。哦、嗯，它叫做 i m b 我们的英文叫做 embody energy。again again， 我不知道中文要怎么翻译。但是如果你去比较这个生产的过程所需要的能源，传统上使用的铁罐、铝罐、玻璃罐，它其实所需要的能源还是比塑胶高很多的。嗯、第二个问题是运送上。玻璃很重，所以其实它在你运送的过、嗯、过程当中呢，呃、嗯，你会消耗的碳。足迹应该会高很多很多，这是为什么我们使用很多塑胶来包装东西，因为它很轻
啊、嗯，而且它很耐摔，也很便宜。那这也是为什么我们会生产这么多。啊、哦，这这背后是有很很复杂的原因在的，而不是只是说哦，塑胶的降解就是一个大问题这样子。谢谢两位老师的讲解，谢谢。那我把时间，对对，我们就把时间，那就给那个宁燕，宁燕在吗？还是齐红要先？齐红在吗？嗯、uh, ，OK， so、oh.。Great talk, Professor. So I have one question. It's because just like you said, it's a, a hydrothermalysis technology that can use to process that many kind of garbage, from the medical garbage to the ocean plastic waste. But my question is, this kind of garbage it come from the environment and they stay in the environment very long time. So which means the plastic surface may、uh, cover or contain many of the chemical from the environment, like in the ocean, it may contain the salts, it may contain some of the biofilm. And for the medical garbage, it may contain some of the like the blood or the antibiotic. So, if false chemical that mixes with the false the plastic waste and enter the hydrothermalysis、uh, oven, and under the high temperature and high pressure, will this kinds of the environment chemical reaction with the plastic and cause some of the、uh, chemical reaction that we didn't hope, or possibly disrupt this kind of oil production? So this is、uh, my question. Thank you. 嗯，呃，我我我呃，我试着用中文回答好了，就是 for the benefit of the all audience 啊、呃，所以问题是说，比如说，嗯、呃，在这些环境当中的塑胶，呃 ，indeed， 他们的确会呃 attach， 会吸附很多呃环境当中其他的呃污染物，我就给大家一个很好的例子就好了，呃，我我们我的组最近我们在研究说，呃，这个藻华。还有呃，生物膜它怎么影响塑胶的表面啊、呃？那在我们这个 hydrothermal 热水解的呃过程当中呢，呃，过去热水解我我们一开始其实拿它来降解一些呃生物废弃物，比如说呃一些呃食物食品的废弃物啊，或是动物的废弃物。所以这个这个问题问起来，比如说呃。就给大家一个比较好的例子，比如说 antibiotics， 它其实很常在啊啊、呃呃、环境当中被发现，因为它呃或者是像一些环境荷尔蒙，这、呃、啊 estrogen， 在我们的 hydrothermal liquefaction 的反应里面呢，它们一般是都可以被降解的，因为温度已经非常非常高了。呃，在呃 scale up 这个过这个技术的过程当中呢，比较令人担忧的其实是 salt。比如说，如果它有吸附一些盐啊，尤其是像啊、呃，在海里面有很多呃钾盐啊，或呃不是钾盐，镁镁 magnesium 或者是呃 calcium base 的的 salt 的话，这有可能会影响我们的反应，这没有错。呃、但是这部分呢，我们还在研究当中。目前根据我们最新的研究呢，某一些 minerals， 比如说 calcium， 它好像对我们的反应不会有影响，没有没有好的影响，也没有坏的影响。在呃 ，oil 已有的方面，但是有一些 metal 呢，比如说像 aluminum， 它比较呃有活性一点点，那它好像对这个反应有一些正面的影响，啊、呃，它好像有点提高我们的油的产率。那我相信也是会有一些呃 mineral 或者是 metal， 它可能会降低我们油的产率。But again， 它就是呃，在这个领域上面呢，还有更多更多研究需要被呃需要被呃 study。才有办法，就是更完整的回答这个问题。那不要说这些呃进入环境当中的塑胶好了，就连我们平常每天用的，我相信大家都有吃洋芋片吧。所以洋芋片打开来呢，它那个洋芋片的袋子，它里面大家不要猜猜看它是几层啊、呃？它其实你你虽然看它是薄薄的一层，但里面其实至少有五层膜，还有 printing 的那一层 PET， 那中间还有 aluminum。那 PET 那一层 print 你你列印呃，比如说多利呃多利多兹啊，或者不同的牌子，它列印的那一层可能还有不同的染料，那可能还有加一些 titanium oxide， 让它看起来亮亮的、啊，大家可能会比较愿意买这样子，也它也比较不会氧化啊、呃，所以就是光是在我们平常啊、呃、消费者使用的这些 packaging， 它本身就有很多很多不同的嗯、呃、contaminant， 其实需要去被研究的了。那我就先简短回答到这里。So, is there any the pre-process we can do for false waste, 
uh, that can use to remove or at least to clean uh, force the environmental chemical from the plastic. Like for example, the low temperatures, uh, as is called hydrothermals uh, uh, carbonization. Can we use this procedure to uh, purify or remove some of the uh, garbage? That's a, a bad molecule that we didn't hope that might will interrupt the hydrothermal lysation. Um. 在这方面呢，其实今天早上还在跟陶氏化学人讨论而已。我们有一个 ongoing project 呢，呃，其实我们是要使用 mill filtration 的方式。mill filtration 它是一个很低温的方式呢。首先，我们会先把 polymer 都溶解掉。那那些无法溶解的 compound 呢，它就这里可能会有一个网子，就把它挡住了。它传统上叫做 m a i l filtration， 这是比较传统上啊、uh, polymer processing industry 他们会 adopt the technology。像在欧洲，他们啊，欧、uh, 洲好几个国家，像是奥地利、德国，他们那边有很多这做专门做这些 polymer recycle 的厂商。呃、uh, ，在这个 m a i l m a i l filtration 的 technology 里面，他们有使用一些镭射的方式来 identify 啊、uh, ，然后呃过滤。这个他们中间可以设置设计不同的网子，那它的上面那个网子的 mesh size 可以挡住一些 minerals， 或是或是比如说呃沙子啊，或是小石头，嗯，但是呢，如果是一些 micro pollutant 的话，呃，以我个人的意见是要做这个 pre treatment 会比较不划算，也比较不可能在呃这一个传统的 m a i l filtration work。那一般啊、呃，在这个过程当中的话，当然我们就可以，比如说先做一些啊、呃、chemical digestion 啊，或者是 physical separation， 这些都是有可能的。但是呢，啊、呃，以我的经验来说，就是啊、呃，现在我还没有啊、呃、注意到还有哪一个组，他现在是在做这个 pre treatment。那有呃，最近我看到一篇文章是，有的人他是有 multi stage 的 heating。他先把啊，他、呃、先在比较低温的状况下 heat up 这个 plastic， 然后再慢慢的把它呃升温，那这样子就可以在不同的 stage 移出不同的东西啊、呃。不过 again， 这要这要我们要在讨论，要根据它的 energy efficiency 还有 techno economy feasibility 来来做讨论。但是这些杂质过滤网，他们只能溶解一些大颗粒的物质。对于真正会干扰塑胶胶联反应的那些小分子，像是甲盐那一些过滤网，应该是很难处理的。嗯、呃，这方面的话，其实可以借由设计大的反应器的时候来处理。比如说这个 hydrothermal technology， 它呃有有被放大制成过，在瑞士的 Porsche Institute， 还有啊、呃、美国的好有有有那个西北西北太平洋国家实验室，他们在放大制成的时候，它可以在啊。呃根据我的了解，他们先 preheat， 呃，不过他们不是处理塑胶，就是他们是处理 LG。那呃，海藻呢，它一般都有很多盐分，所以他们通常会先设计设，先把它给 preheating， 然后在一个地方呢，把呃 preheating 之后，它有一个 trap， 这个 trap 呢，它它可以把这些盐分都收集起来，所以或许可以跟这些做呃海藻热水解的人啊、呃、学习，应该是可以跟这些人学习的。嗯，好，非常谢谢老师的回答。哦，不会不会，他他是这个是这个很重要很很好的问题。不过我觉得一般应该是呃要在 upscaling 放大制成的时候才有办法 address， 因为你才有办法累积足够的盐，然后在某个地方设置一个 trap 把它给移除这样子。那一般我们在做这个热水酒的反应的时候，它可以在放大制成的时候它可以 multiple stage 的 heat up。嗯，谢谢谢谢七号跟跟 Grace 老师，呃，我们在聊天板上面还有两个问题，我不知道 Grace 老师是不是看得到，呃，我很快的简短的 relay 一下，呃 ，Are the products of of degradable polymers harmful to the environment? If so, how should we deal with that? 那这是第一个问题，或许两个问题您可以一起。看看怎么回答哈。那第二个问题是，呃，谢翠娟问的，她说 ，We use many plastic materials for packing foods, such as PP and PS. How stable are these plastic polymers? Could they be very easily break down and contaminate foods and enter human bodies? Are these materials safe for us? 
我可以先回答第二个问题。我们今天早上才 host 啊、呃、高中生来参访我们的学校，他们也问了类似的问题。我们还在讨论说哪些啊、呃、塑胶可以 microwaveable safe， 哪些不是。那我可以跟你说，一般 polypropylene、polyethylene 它们都很 stable 的，嗯，然后你一般比如说你在使用微波炉的时候啊，如果你是对这方面有 concern 的话 ，poly 你要看一下它下面是不是标说是 microwaveable 的，如果它没有说 microwaveable 的话，一般我我个人呢、啊、尽量还是不会加热它，啊、嗯，不 stable 本身的不是 polymer， 而是嵌在 polymer 里面的 additive， 因为我们在制作这些 polymer 的时候。呃，一般来说我们会加一些添加剂进去，让它变得比如说更稳定。那 polypropyl polypropylene 跟 polyethylene 它是相对呃稳定的，它们的熔点呢一般是在一百一百三十到一百七十度 C 之间。那一般你在微波炉里面不可能加热到那么热，这是第一点。第二点呢 ，PS polystyrene 我绝对不会建议你把它加热，因为 polystyrene 它的这个嗯。呃呃、uh, ，glass transition point 非常的低，在六十呃，我想一下，不对，这个是呃，在九十度 C 左右啊、呃，我想一下哦，不好意思，我我要确认一下。不过 polystyrene 一般是比较不稳定的，那一般比如说呃，就是我们俗称的保利龙。那有时候有一些，我小时候老不知道现在还有没有，我小时候有时候去便当店，他们会用。他们会用保利龙来装。那有时候如果食物过热，你就看到保利龙有点融掉，那就是因为，呃，它已经开始进入了一个玻璃相变化的点。所以 polystyrene 相对是不可以拿来装热水，也不可以拿来装，呃，相对热的食物的。装冷的食物是没有问题的。那一样的问题也在那个 PLA， 我们刚刚讲那个呃 polylactic acid 生物可降解的塑塑胶。它一般只能拿来装冷水，它的呃玻璃相变点一般是在六十度 C 左右，所以如果你拿来装热水，它马上就融给你看了，哦、呃，所以呃就大概简短的回答一下。但是我们生活上用的 PP 啊、呃、PE 呃那一般 PP 跟 PE 比较常被拿来装热的食物，他们是没有问题的。然后再来是呃第一个问题是 Are the products the Of degradable polymers harmful to the environment. So, then we need to define what is degradable polymers. Ah, I don't know if this person is in the audience. But if he is, if he is there, can you explain the question a little bit? Otherwise, I will have to explain it myself. 如果在线上的话，扣扣啊、uh, ，那不然就是请 Grace 老师直接帮我们诠释诠释看看。呃<笑>、uh, ，我个人的认知是 degradable polymer， 它可能是在讲说是 biodegradable 生物可降解的高分子。那一般啊， uh, 生物可降解的高分子就我刚刚讲的 p o a 就是一个最好的例子。啊、uh, ，它其实是从一般是从玉米开始做。啊、uh, ，比如说啊，它分分。发发呃发酵了玉米 ，fermented 之后呢，制造了呃一些乳酸，那从乳酸才开始进行反应，所以听起来很美好，它可以从一些生物质里面提炼，但是呢，根据一些啊啊、呃呃、life cycle assessment， 还有一些碳足迹的分一些分析碳足迹的研究，他们有发现说，制造这个呃制造这个 PLA 的过程，跟制造 PE 的过程比起来。它还是会需要呃很多的能源，所以 energy wise 它还是有很大的呃碳排放量。那它使用的 chemical 其实呃来制作这个高分子的 PLA， 它还是呃相对来说还是蛮多的，所以它还是有很多的进步的过程。就算你使用生物可降解附加好了，所以我会我个人会觉得使用 biodegradable polymers。除非它是真的最后可以降解，比如说 PHA、PHB 好了，它是已经被证实说它可以在海洋里面啊、呃、两年内是可以降解的。PHA、PHB 它们可能会相对好一点啊、呃。不过这这个要 case by case， 你要看你说的说的啊、呃、biodegradable polymer 是什么样子。那这部分我觉得 biodegradable polymer 还有很长很长的一段路要走，嗯、呃。
我个人的见解是，呃，要双管齐下，比如说要要持续的 study biodegradable polymer， 比如说拿 PLA 来讲好了。还是有很多人在研究说，怎么样让 p o a 的制成比较对环境是比较友好的，啊、嗯，然后它的碳足迹排放量不会那么大，还有怎么样它最后可以真的降解，啊、嗯，有的人会把 p o a 跟 PHA 做 blend， 哦、嗯，就是做混合，或者是把 p o a 跟其他可以降解的 polymer 叫做，哦、嗯，还有另外一个 polymer 叫 PCL， 啊、嗯，也是做混合，然后是在，啊、嗯。生意材料上面做应用，所以这部分我觉得、呃、还是有很多东西会需要被研究这样子。好，谢谢 Grace 老师。那我自己一个比较不知道成不成熟的问题，呃，以我们这样子的技术，那我们不断的研发跟了解到一些新的方法，通常会多快被寄转到废弃物处理厂或者是产业里面？一般是一发现，然后一直到真正的被用用到这样子。呃、以我的见解，这这有好几个呃 factor 在 promote。一来呢，是因为啊、呃，我不知道大家有没有看新闻，不过联合国它即将会有一个，他们在讨论这个 plastic treaty， 叫做嗯啊、呃呃，中文还是不太知道怎么翻译，但是呢。他可能会对这些塑胶产品开始 charge 一些额外的钱，然后二来呢是美国政府在呃两个礼拜前，拜登政府他们才刚刚宣布了说，呃、在二零二零五零年之前，他想要呃百分之九十以上的塑胶都是呃 bio derived， 或者是要他要是可以 re recyclable 的，那因为有这些政府呃的的规定。还有 promotion， 我觉得寄转的速度会被加速。那在过去，我觉得一般，呃，这个废弃物回收的领域是相对保守的。我老实说好了，所以一般其实研究应该都要十年、二十年以上。但是因为这一些 treaty 啊、policy 啊、regulation 啊、呃、的关系，每个厂商都有很大的压力，他们要做这个塑胶回收，所以寄转的速度是会被加快的。像我刚讲的那个，嗯、呃。韩国 LG Chemical 的例子好了，他们就是跟一个、呃、英国的厂商合作，那英国的厂商叫做 m i r a Technology， 他们把他们的技术 license 寄转给 LG Chemical， 那帮助这个 LG Chemical 在南韩建立他们的厂。那同样的，他们也有把技术、呃、寄转给陶氏化学，那陶氏化学是在欧洲也会建、呃应该是在欧洲，我还没有仔细的看啊、呃，因为陶氏化学在美国也，它才是它的大本营，但是他们也有准准备要做这个技转啊、呃，所以很多呃这些呃 petrochemical 石油化学大厂，他们都有跟各式各样不同的小公司正在做这个技转，来啊、呃、发展这方面的呃科技就是了，但主要就是因为联合国、欧盟还有美国开始都有很呃比较。啊、呃，苛刻的一些比较严格的一些啊、呃、，regulation。所以现在是会越来越快的去链接我们学术界跟产业界之间这样子的知识跟技术上的交换。那我们现在线上林燕或是燕宁，呃，回来了，有没有要问问题？来，嗯、呃，有，老师听得到吗？可以，嗯。嗯、呃，老师 ，Grace 老师好，谢谢你早上很精彩的演讲。那我是严明，我是一家环境问台湾一家环境问公司的执行长。那我们主要是在做这个海洋废弃物的调查。那我想分享一下，其实，在我们台湾就是本岛跟离岛调查里面，其实渔业相关的废弃物大概是占比六七成，所以大部分都是保利龙 EPS。以往跟绳索，它主要是埋论，然后还有一些硬塑胶浮球。那硬塑胶浮球的材料就比较多，是有 ABS， 然后也有一些是杂塑胶综合在一起，就是它可能是用呃废的塑胶料，就是做成这个这个浮球。所以嗯、呃，今天听完你的演讲，我在想，您提到的那个呃新的技术，不知道有没有办法处理，就是这类型的。
。所以你知道询问在渔业相关使用的这些废弃塑胶吗？对，因为其实我们发现，在台湾海岸上，其实呃 P E 跟 P P 的这个量其实是。相对很少的，可能百分之三、百分之五而已。其实大部分百分之六七十，尤其是保利龙 EPS， 可能占四五十，都是这种废弃的保利龙，越用的这种发泡的保利龙。那不知道您您刚刚提到的这种，嗯，您实验室在在研研发的这样的新的技术，有没有办法处理这样子类型的废弃？因为在台湾目前没有办法处理，所以其实大部分都是。都是粉化，了解。所以，呃，这些以我个人的意见，这些 EPS， 尤其是在海边附近被发现的话，他们应该一般都是呃非常呃，我会说 highly contaminated， 非常污染非常的严重，然后也已经降解了，所以。再送回去做机械回收可能会不适合，因为嗯、呃，它的它的分子量啊，或者一些污染物可能都会导致机械回收的困难。那如果他们的成分是相对嗯、呃、单纯的话，比如说我们知道它是 PS、ABS 或者是尼龙啊、呃、base， 那或许可以啊、呃，我我我个人会觉得这些啊啊、呃呃、热水解或者是使用啊、呃、有机溶剂来做。啊、uh, ，dissolution precipitation 可能会是比较合适的方式，因为像 PS 啊、uh, ，polystyrene 好了，不管是 polystyrene 或 ABS， 它一旦被热降解之后，它应该会被啊、uh, 转化原转化成它本来的啊、uh, monomer， 它是有机会被再变变回去它本来的 monomer 的。像 polystyrene 已经有一些厂商。哦、呃，他们号称说，就是已经可以使用 pyrolysis 的热降解的方式，把它变回啊、呃，就是变回 poly 啊、呃、styrene monomer again 这样子。所以应该这两个方法都是蛮值得试试看的，就要取决说这个呃渔业发现的这些废弃物有多脏，我觉得还有多复杂。嗯，不过不过，其实我们有做呃类似的研究。过去我也有学生，他就是啊、呃，他们就是去海边捡很多一些塑料回来，然后我们就是做分析，然后呃，我们还没有把它降解降解下来，就是我们就是做完统计，然后分析这样子而已。嗯，谢谢老师，因为我知道在冲绳就是有一些偏远小岛。那他们处理这个海贝其实蛮困难的，所以有一些小岛的确他们会利用这个 p y r o l y s i s 的方式来把这个保利龙转成油吗？燃油？它它会转回去原本的 monom， 它会转回去原本的 chemical， 但是也可以当油、嗯、没有错，当油用就是有点浪费，就是。对，但他们就发现这个转换效率不是很好。一个可能是像您讲的，这个保利龙就是高度的污染，所以他们要除去这个杂质，就要花很多的力气。那另外一个是经济考量，就是这样子，嗯、呃，处理完以后，这个即使可以燃油，可以再拿来利用，也是不太合乎经济效益的。就现在好像有这些的困难，这样。了解，呃呃，今天我们没有空谈到 pyrolysis， 不过 pyrolysis 一般，呃，中文可能可以翻成热裂解，因为 pyro 这里就是热的意思啊、呃。呃，在这个 pyrolysis 下面，它一般会需要使用所谓的催化剂，还有呃，必须要有提供氢气来，呃。让这个呃 polymer 的降解更有效率一点点。那如果它是在一个 non catalytic 的 pyrolysis 的话，基本上基本上呃塑胶它传热是非常非常慢的，所以可能在传热上，在热传上就是会有一些呃可能会没有一些优势啦，跟在呃水热解里面的反应比起来这样子。不过这这个这个方面。还有很多基础研究需要被完成啊、呃，这部分我们的我的组也还还在啊、呃、进行相关的研究而已。好的，谢谢谢谢严宁，也谢谢 Grace 老师。那我刚刚呢，呃，邀请了我们上个月的呃唐老师，是不是也来给我们做一个很简短很简短的回应？因为我们今天时间比较紧了。唐老师，唐老师是我们在宁波诺丁汉大学啊、呃，那也是在处做这个废弃物处理相关的。呃，专业领域，那我们直接请唐老师讲比较专业好了。其实，其实今天的讲
呃，演讲内容我也学很多，因为其实我的呃，我并不是完全专注在废弃物处理上，我可能比较呃比较在意的是就是环境管理政还有环境政策方面的，所以其实上周的讲题可可能是一个比较怎么讲比较大方向的一个讲法。今天我听陈老师的演讲，我学到很多比较细致的东西，我要回去好好研读您您在那个。slide 里面 cite 的那些 papers， 我应该会学很多东西。那我就今天就是，我只是就我的心得简短讲一下，就是说，刚刚其实在问答的时候也非常精彩，就是有提到那个医疗废弃物的事情。我刚好因为前一阵子，呃，因为另外一个演讲的关系，我稍微查了一下，其实医疗废弃物它可能最大的争点就是为什么它总是用燃烧，是因为它有。需要呃，比一般的废弃物有更大的就是杀菌跟灭菌的需求。那如果燃烧以高温来处理的话，其实这个部分可能就会比较呃比较没有疑虑。但是其实我知道，就一般的医院他们在燃烧之前，他们也都会在先做灭菌处理，后再把废弃物燃烧。所以在这个过程中，他们的确耗费的能量跟金钱都是比一般的废弃物处理还要多。我倒是觉得老师刚刚提的那个呃，就是那个 super critical。呃、嗯，海海 super critical water 的这个 treatment 方法，说不定可以一次解决所有就是医疗废弃物的需求，然后把这个废弃物呃做重新的处理，这倒是还蛮有趣的一个蛮有趣的一个想法。说不定因为医疗废弃物的处理成本本来就比较高，所以如果呃用现在这种比较新，可能呃花费也比较高的方式的话，或许是。那有，然后呃，对，其他的就是说，刚刚在对于不不纯物的处理，我倒是有几个，可能是从比较大大方向来说的想法。第一个是说，原来我们在呃设计这个包装跟任何的这个 product 的时候，都用了这么多的东西去把它 mix 起来，的确会造成后续就是重新 recycling material 的呃。的问题，所以也许甚至在设计端都都可以，都值得去想这个 circular economy 的的的过程。然后再来就是说，嗯，其实老师在提的这些处理方法，我觉得以后这个这个呃 recycling industry 应该会变成一个产业链。就是老师说的这个处理的程序，可能每一个不同的这个 industry， 它都想要得到不同的原料，所以可能它就会变成是一个呃。链接的方式，我先处理了这一段，然后再把它送到另外一个地方，然后他们再汲取他们需要的东西，然后最后到到最后的末端处理，可能就是燃烧或者是掩埋这样子。那希望这个产业链能够赶快的发生，所以我们可以就是更更有效的重新 recycle 我们的 materials， 然后还有就是对于它的这个能源汲取的效率也可以提高。那我今天可能大概就呃。讲到这边，然后非常谢谢陈老师的,的演讲，我我获益良多。对，是谢谢陈老师。谢谢那陈老师还有没有要回应的？哦、呃，我想一下哦，呃，看一下还有大家还有什么问题吗？哦，没有没有了，大概没有了。大家如果还有问题的话，可以啊、呃，欢迎追踪我的 LinkedIn 啊、呃，然后也可以在啊、呃，可以可以再讨论这样子。好，谢谢谢谢陈老师，那也谢谢唐老师今天帮我做了一个比较专业的结论哈。那呃呃，再次感谢 Grace 老师给我们很精彩也很重要的这样的一个讲座。那我也很开心听到了我们从学生端、产业端还有学术界各方面的呃进来的问题跟意见还有回馈。那今天也看到了不同场次的老师们的对话，那我就觉得哎，好，觉得我们这样子的一个科学的系列慢慢的。呃，希望可以造成更多的呃广泛大众的一些这些对这些话题的一些影响。那因为时间的关系呢，我们必须在这边呢告一个段落。那再次的谢谢 Grace 老师还有唐老师，那跟我们一起参加今天的讲座，谢谢，谢谢更谢谢大家。好，谢谢邀请，好，好，大家拜拜，拜拜，谢谢。